Hi guys, so in this video I'm going to be covering antivirals, TB medication and HIV medication. Please note that in these videos I just covered the most important things that you need to know. You still need to read your notes that you are given by a lecturer to get a full understanding of the information that you've been given and also to cover the other small nitty gritty stuff that they have in there that I just think is extra information. I just cover the most important stuff. So first with antiviral therapy. The most common viral infections that we have is HIV, hepatitis B and C. Also A can be included here. Then we've got cytomegalovirus. This virus causes a lot of symptoms but it mostly causes you to have herpes or it can cause some liver issues. Then you've got influenza A and B and the most recent one which is COVID-19. Please note that antibiotics do not help with viral infections so if someone comes to the clinic or to the hospital and they've got a flu or they've got a cold they are most probably affected by a virus and thus giving them antibiotics will not help in any way shape or form and please note that antiviral therapies they have got limited efficacy that means they are not effective in the treatment of viral infections they don't really kill um, the viral infection so antiviral therapy is mostly virostatic meaning it just stops the virus from spreading even further but it does not kill the virus and as a result most of the treatment that we give our patients with viral infections is we treat symptoms so for example when a patient comes into the cleaning with a flu or a common cold most symptoms that they will have is they've got some nasal congestion some will have a cough and most probably they will have a fever and as a result we give paracetamol for the fever nasal congestions will give them if it's a baby most probably they'll give them um, normal saline or if it's an adult they'll give them the spray that they put in the nose and then when it's a cough um so the Western Cape government or the South African government have actually taken out cough medication out of our, um, I guess you can say bank of medications because, because they say it actually doesn't help in curing that. So obviously natural remedies like your lemon and honey tea and that sort of thing. So we treat symptoms and you know the viral antiviral medication they just stop the virus from spreading further but it doesn't kill it so when it comes to antivirals there's mainly two types you've got your nucleosides or your nucleotides and then you've got your neuraminidase inhibitors please go recap on the mechanism of action of these antivirals so you have an understanding or you have a picture of how it works but when it comes to your nucleosides they are a dna polymerase inhibitor so a dna polymerase is the enzyme that opens up the dna strand to allow for dna replication so as a result, if you stop that process, you stop the virus from replicating and becoming more. And as a result, you stop it spreading even further. Examples of this is anything that ends with clovir, which is your acyclovir, canciclovir, phalacyclovir, and your flanciclovir. The most common one is acyclovir. So acyclovir is using the treatment and prophylaxis of herpes simplex. Please note that it distributes widely. So that means it goes into different organs, but most dangerous one is it enters your cerebrospinal fluid and that means it can cause some head issues so it can have a viral infection in your head and you don't want to have that that might cause meningitis and that's a whole lot of issues that goes with that and also please note that it's eliminated or it's excreted by your kidneys and as a result if you have any other drugs that are excreted by your kidneys you need to be aware of their drug interactions because if they react together very badly it can actually cause renal or kidney damage and then you've got canciclovir this is for treatment and prophylaxis of any cytomegalovirus infections especially in your immunocompromised patients such as your hiv and your cancer patients this one is also distributed widely that means it can enter your csf so please be aware of this and especially for patients that are immunocompromised as the same one it's form or for patients that have previously had meningitis please be aware when this medication is being given to them because it can actually exacerbate 
that issue it's also eliminated in your kidneys so please be aware of drug interactions and it's contraindicated in pregnancy and women that are breastfeeding because it can be passed on to the child and then also please note that the side effects it causes myelosuppression which means that it kills the um, red blood cells in your bone marrow and as a result that can decrease your red blood cells in your body causing anemia or it can decrease the level of your white blood cells and that can cause you to be affected with many infections especially if it's an immunocompromised patient they already have a low level of white blood cells and if you give them this for an extended period of time it actually lowers your white blood so a level and that will cause a lot of issues so please be aware of these side effects and then we've got our neuraminidase inhibitors so they inhibit the release of your influenza virus outside of the host so the host is the someone who has the virus in them so if you stop it from passing on to someone else, you can stop it being spread among people. Examples of this would be Alcetamifir and Tenamifir. Or Alcetamifir is also known as Temiflu. And this treatment must be given within 24 to 48 hours or it will not be effective at all. And it's obviously prophylaxis for high-risk patients. So patients that cannot get influenza and it's mostly patients that are immunocompromised. Your HIV patients, um, patients that have got cancer or any autoimmune illnesses, they must get this when they develop an influenza <clears throat> infection they must get this as prophylaxis or they can just receive it to prevent them having serious symptoms should they get the virus adverse effects is obviously nausea and vomiting and then sanamifir it does the exact same thing but it's just the powder that you inhale so that's the most basic things that you need to know when it comes to your antivirals Next, we have our tuberculosis or our TB medication. So, obviously, we know that it's caused by a myobacteria tuberculosis. That's the name of the microorganism. So, how you diagnose TB, the most basic one that they use is symptoms. So, the most common symptoms that you need to know for anyone is a cough for more than two weeks, night sweats, loss of appetite, unintentional weight loss. So, you need to take a proper history taking of the patient because if they're on any diet or they are on some constricting eating pattern or you know they're intentionally doing something to lose weight obviously can't count out as tb symptom and then also if they have any malaise or tiredness or fatigue that could be a possible symptom of tb but also you need to differentiate whether it's a tb symptom if it's a COVID symptom since now we do have both but the most basic one that differentiates between the two is the night sweats and the loss of weight but obviously you just need to make sure that you're doing a proper history taking so that you know whether it's TB or COVID-19. Then next we have our sputum examination so once you have these symptoms the most ones that they use if you have a cough and you have the night sweats then they will expect you to have a gene expect done this is when you cough up mucus and you spit in a small little blue specimen jar it gets sent off to the lab and they will check if there's presence of the myobacteria and also if it's to check its sensitivity to remphampicin because obviously if it's not sensitive to rifampicin and it can overcome rifampicin that means you have uh what you call it extreme drug resistant or just drug resistant tb and that will cause you to have a different treatment regimen and that sort of thing but if it's sensitive to rifampicin that means you be put on the normal first line regimen of tb treatment then also they would do what is known as a spear a smear microscopy so if your smear is positive that means there's a risk for infection but if it's negative that means you still have the virus in you but there's 
no chance or there's a small chance of you transmitting TB to other people. And as a result, you want your smear to be negative after two months on being on treatment because after two months, you should not be able to spread TB. So that's why in the first two months, you still need to do to have your mask and be more cautious how you act around people because you're still quite infectious but after two months you should not be but obviously still continuing with your tb treatment so if your smear is still positive after um, two months that means that the treatment might not be working and they obviously have to change you to another medication treatment cool so when it comes to tb treatment there is combination or different phases of tb treatment so you've got the intensive phase and the continuation phase the intensive phase is usually for two months and then continuation phase is four months meaning that you have a total of six months on treatment i'll speak later on about you know when you have drug resistant tb and how it becomes longer and that sort of thing. So the most basic TB regimen that you will have is a combination of isoniazid, rimfampicin, pyrazinamide, and entambutol. And it's called a fixed dose tablet, where it's one tablet with all four medications. And the reason why they did this is for adherence purposes. If you were to give a patient the each of those medications singularly and tell them to take it every single day they would get tired of it and there will be a less chance of them actually finishing their treatment because swallowing four tablets every day is annoying so it's easier if it's just one tablet for all of them and also please be aware that when they are doing <clears throat> giving you the medication they give it to you according to your weight so for example if you're between 55 to 69 kilograms they'll give you four tablets so now imagine if you're being given an individual one for each of those medications and it has to be four times that would be 16 tablets that you'd be getting so as a result that's why they made it one pill so isoniazide it Please, the first part about what it does, please refresh yourself on what these TB medications do. So, in general, it takes the cell wall of the virus and the different medications attack different parts of that cell wall. And as a result, that's how it stops the virus from not the virus, the bacteria. It attacks the different parts of the bacteria and that's how it kills the bacteria. So please go watch videos. I've put a few down in the description so you can go watch how these TB medications work. But the general part of it is just it affects the cell wall. There's different parts of the cell wall and it just attacks different parts. So as I said, the most basic side effect is it's hepatotoxic. So it affects your liver. So please be aware that if you are taking any other medications that are also hepatotoxic, like if you're on any other antibiotics, please be aware of those drug interactions. And it causes peripheral neuropathy, which is pretty much a tingliness in your fingers. And sometimes you can stop feeling things, your fingers become numb and that sort of thing. So as a result, with your TB treatment, they will supplement you with vitamin B6 because it helps to slow down that peripheral neuropathy or to counteract it. Then we've got rimfampicin. Side effect is GI, so stomach cramps, nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, and causes discoloration of bodily fluids. So if you've ever worked in a medical ward, you would have known that when you crush most of the TB medication, it turns orange. And it is because of the rimfampicin. And as a result, you need to take it with food just to decrease that discoloration of your bodily fluids. And it also causes what is known as enzyme reduction. So what this means, if you take it with any other medication, it decreases the bioavailability or the amount of drug that is in your body. So for example, if you're taking it with any oral contraceptives, it decreases the amount of oral contraceptives that are being absorbed by your body. And as a result, your oral contraceptives become less effective. And as a result, you might become pregnant. So as a result, they are contraindicated with your oral contraceptives because it affects 
how it functions obviously if you're on oral contraceptives and you're on tb treatment they're more likely to put you on the injectable contraceptives like a petrogen or a restorate or they'll give an implant just to obviously avoid those strike interactions or that sort of thing then we've got parazinamide uh, side effects include joint pain and it's also hepatoxic and then ethambutol in side effect is ocular neuritis so it affects your vision and that is as a result they will do what is known as vision checks so as you can see with these medications they cause vision issues they cause nerve damage they cause joint pain and that sort of thing so as a result when you are started on tb treatment they'll put you on what is known as dot dots this is directly observed treatment short course so for about seven to ten days you'll be going to the clinic every single day they'll give you a medication for that day you drink it and you go home and obviously they have to now ask you questions are you suffering from any numbness in your fingers is there any joint pain is there any vision issues or any other side effects that the patient might be experiencing and obviously they discuss the patient should they need to change it they will do so so they just do it for those seven to ten days to make sure that the patient understands what is going on and also to avoid having those serious symptoms happen to the patient and if they are happening they can change the treatment so they would do that for seven to ten days and then after that they'll be given medication for a longer period of time so they're not coming back every single day and then if you are in a community area then you have community health workers coming to check up on you instead of you going to the clinic every single day okay so how the regimen works is if you've got pulmonary tb which is the most common one that most people will have you will put on the please be aware of the hrz thing. so H is your isoniazide, R is your infampicin, pyrazinamide is Z, and then ethambutol is E. So you'll be put on a combination on all four for two months, which obviously starts with the seven days or ten days of dots. Also, in addition to pyridoxine to avoid that peripheral neuropathy. Then after two months, you have a smear. And then if the smear is negative, then they will continue you on isoniazide and rimfampicin for four months in addition to the pyridoxine, which is your continuation phase. And then if you have complicated or severe TB, which is like your TB meningitis or you've got TB of the bones and the joints, they'll put you on the basic four for two months and then... In your continuation phase it becomes seven months instead of the normal four months obviously in addition to paradoxin and then when it comes to children they i um, obviously when it comes to children it's anyone younger than the age of eight or less than 30 kilograms if you're over that you're counted as an adult when it comes to tb treatment they will give you asinizer rimfampicin and paranesamide but they will not give you anthambutol because of the side effects of the vision obviously they don't want to give that to young kids because they're still developing and growing you don't want to damage their eyes when they're so young and then they'll do the same thing in the continuation phase then when they have complicated tb they unfortunately have to be given the enthambutal but obviously they have to be constantly observed to check for the side effects of the eyes and then in the continuation phase it's also for seven months the same as with adults so when it comes to drug resistance there's two types of drug resistance that you might develop you can develop multidrug drug resistant, which is when you are resistant to isoniazide and rifampicin, or you have XDR, which is when you are um, resistant to both isoniazide and rifampicin and any other um, second line drug treatment that you might get. So if it's in that case, you be put on a whole different combination of drugs that we're going to discuss in a minute so i just want to make you guys aware of when you have a resistance to isoniazide you can have two types of immunized mutations 
So you've got a mutation of ionoside A and cat G. Don't worry about what all these things mean. But when you do hear that your patient has got an INH A mutation, they will be given a higher dosage of isoniazide. And then if, got, if they have a cat G mutation, then they will use another medication known as ethionamide. Cool. So when you are on TB treatment and you've got a drug resistant TB, you can either be put on the short course or the long course. So the short course is nine months. This is for adults, pregnant women and children older than six and more than 16 kilograms. You'll be put on linozolid, which will be given for two months. And then you'll be given a high dose of isoniazid for four months. Then you'll be put on betaquilin for six months. And then levoflexin, clovozimine, parazinamide and endambutol for nine months. And then obviously the other ones finish before the number four. Please note that you don't have to know... <coughs> what medications your patient to be on because the doctors do sort out the whole short course and long course and what medication that they are on because it depends on the conditions that your patient has because obviously if they still want to have kids or they've got liver or renal failure and that sort of thing it to affect how much medication and which type of medication they can get as a result of that. So don't worry about it, but just know that if they're on the short course, these are the medications that they will get. And then when it comes to the long course, you're getting it for 18 months. Your core drugs would be betaquilin, dinosolid, levoflaxin, terizidone, and clafazimin. And then obviously it has to be administered with pyridoxine to prevent peripheral neuropathy. So when it comes to your long course, you've got group A, B, and C. So group A and B, they'll be given together and then C, they'll add it on to A and B if the regimen is not complete or if one of the drugs in A or B are not able to be used. So in group A, you've got three drugs, which is your levoflaxin or moxifloxacin. And these are included if you have any CNS disease or you are likely to get a CNS disease. And then obviously if the patient is um, resistant to any fluoroquinolones, then obviously they would take Levoflux, they will take out levofloxin out and as a result they might take any other medications from group C to replace that one. And then we've got betaquilin. Please note that the side effects include QT prolongation where QT is the different ways that occur in your heart and as a result that will cause some heart issues. Drug interactions with any hepatotoxic drugs so your antibiotics and that sort of thing. And then also interacts with your fluoroquinolones, your macrolides, and your clovazimine. So if you're taking any of those medications, please be aware of the drug interactions that you might have if your patient is on TB treatment. And then you've got linozolid. You need to avoid if the patient obviously has a resistance to linozolid because if you give it, it will really not do anything. And if your patient has an HP of less than 8 because it could actually cause their HP levels to go even lower. And then obviously you can substitute this one should you not be able to use it with delaminate from group C. Please note that delaminate also causes QT prolongation and you need to take it with food to diminish GI upset such as your nausea, vomiting and dizziness. So all these medications that cause QT prolongation, they will constantly have to have EEGs or ECGs to just find out what is going on with the patient to avoid having any heart issues. And then when it comes to your group B medication, you need to include one or both of them in addition to your group A medications. So your group B medication include clofazimine, which also causes QT prolongation, and it causes a red-brown tinge to your conjunctiva, same as your other regimen of TB medication. So it does the same thing that trimfampicin does. And also you need to take it with food to diminish GI upset and also monitor your hepatic and renal functions because it does cause some damage to them. And then we've got terizidone, which is included for CNS disease just to avoid having that CNS disease because remember most of them, they are distributed widely. They can enter your CSF, so you need to ensure 
now there's no side effects regarding that so group c you add them to complete the regimen so for example if you have to take out levoflexin because you're resistant to fluoroquinolone you take one of the ones from group c that can either be ethambutol or parazinamide etc etc and if you've got elenozolid resistant then you replace it with delaminid so group c medications include ethambutol that only if it's able to be used or if it's someone who's not a child because of the vision issues that you might have and then obviously we already spoke about the limonet and this one mustn't be given in kids under the age of six because they're not quite sure of the dosing that they can give to those kids and then we've got parazinamide um amikacin ethoniamide and para amino benzoic acid this can be used to replace bedaquiline in children younger than three years so these are the medications you don't really need <laughs> to know how they put them together the doctors decide all of this and also depends on the type of conditions that your patients have so you've got the three eyes of your tb or hiv medication so the first eye is intensified TB case finding. So the first one is all HIV patients need to be screened for TB at each visit and majority of patients need to be screened to ensure that all patients with TB symptoms, they are taken care of um, and they start TB treatment as soon as possible. And if someone in the family has TB and is on treatment, they'll obviously want to have all the close contacts tested. And should they be a high chance of them being affected by TB, they obviously have to be started on TB treatment or they can be put on TB prophylaxis. And then the second I is isoniazide preventative therapy. So so if someone is HIV positive and they have a relative or family member that is got TB and is likely to be active TB, then they will put on isoniazide preventative therapy, also known as Bactrim, just to, be, to protect the HIV patient from developing TB because obviously the immunocompromised is a high chance of them having TB. And then also the third eye is infection control in the health facilities and in the households to prevent the spread of HIV, I mean of TB. Okay, so that was tuberculosis. That one went very quickly. Now we have HIV. HIV is quite long. There's a lot of medications that you need to know with HIV. So the general information that you need to know with regards to HIV there's about 7.2 million people with HIV, but only 4.4 million are on antiretroviral therapy. So that means about, what, 3 million people still don't know their status or they're not on ARV. So that's a lot of people that could actually die as a result of it because they don't know their status. And as a result, that's why the hashtag know your status is such a big movement because they want everyone to start on ARVs because you can actually live a normal life if you're on ARVs. If not, you start getting other illnesses and die and that sort of thing. So there's about 270,000 new infections each year and majority of these are caused because people do not know their status and as a result they include themselves in unsafe sex and all of that jazz and as a result end up being infected and then another thing is pmtct which is prevention of mother to child transmission so the goal is to have less than two percent of transmission rate and as a result that's why all pregnant women I tested for HIV almost three times during their pregnancy. I think it's taken the day that you start or you register yourself for maternity care. And then I think it's in week 28, 35, and then just after birth. But yeah, correct me if I'm wrong then. And also after the child is born, um, the child will have to be tested at birth six weeks six weeks 10 weeks sometimes 14 weeks six months and then six weeks after they stop 
breastfeeding and if the mother is tested positive the day that they register for their maternity care or the day that they find out they're pregnant they need to be started on treatment that same day and then also we've got what is known as the joint united nations program or UNAIDS on HIV and AIDS they have what is known as the 1990 target so they want to have 90% of people living with HIV to know their status and for 90% of people living with HIV to be an ARV therapy and for 90% of people receiving ARVs to have durable viral suppression so that they can obviously have you know normal marriages and they're not spreading it as quickly as it is because people have such low viral suppressions <clears throat> so we've got what is known as arv therapy or or highly active antiretroviral therapy so the goal of arvs is directly it stops the viral production by decreasing your viral load and also indirectly it helps your immune recovery so when you're decreasing the viral load which is the amount of viral copies that are within your body you can allow your immune system to recover and as a result your cd4 cells increase so that's the whole goal of arvs please recap on the mechanism of hiv and arvs and how they affect the viral cells okay so the principles of arvs is that it's a long life combination therapy and for them to have good adherence they also use a fixed dose combination that's taken once daily the same as your tb treatment so there are six classes of arvs you've got your nucleoside reverse transcriptase inhibitors then you've got your non-nucleoside reverse transcriptase inhibitors, protease inhibitors, integrase inhibitors, fusion inhibitors, and chemokine receptor antagonists. So all these different classes affect the virus in different ways. For example, your nucleoside reverse transcriptase inhibitors, it stops the cells, I mean it stops the virus from replicating itself by inserting itself into the different uh, nucleotides so your adenine guanine cytosine and thymine so it stops the viral from replicating itself by changing the order of those nucleotides so these antiviral medications affect different parts of the virus itself so please go recap on this so you have a better understanding of it so with your nucleoside reverse transcriptase the most common ones that you need to know is your abacafir, your emtricitabine, lamivudine, uh, stavudine, tenofovir, and your zidovudine. Zidovudine is mostly given to kids as a prophylaxis for HIV, but the most important one is tenofovir and emtricitabine. So when it comes to tenofovir, it's a fixed dose medication. So I'll speak about this, you know, later on when you're talking about the first line treatment of HIV. So the fixed dose is 300 milligrams per dose once daily. Side effects includes um, it affects your kidneys and your bones, and as a result, you must avoid giving this one to children because it's still developing and that sort of thing. And then drug in interactions is any drugs that are nephrotoxic or so any drugs that affect your kidneys or your nephrons you need to watch out for those drug interactions because if they come together it's a joint force and they actually affect it even further so you must <clears throat> you must only use to never fear if you've got a creatinine clearance of more than 15 milliliters per minute so this is more about how well your liver is able to break down this drug so as a result if you want to never fear you'll be doing your creatinine blood results often to just check how well you're doing so that you don't affect your kidneys even further and cause kidney damage and please be aware that if you've got hepatitis um, infection while you also have got an HIV infection and you want tenofovir they can actually team up and affect your liver 
even further so you need to be aware of that so knowing about your patient's condition and history really is important when giving these medications and then the next one is lamivudine so the dosing is 150 milligrams 12 hourly so that would be twice a day or 300 milligrams once daily we always try to aim to have it once daily because the more medication that you give your patient the less likely they're going to take them because it's a whole lot so as a result lamivudine is mostly part of your fixed dose combination which is usually just one tablet with four tablets in it and then if the patient has renal impairment you need to adjust the dosage because um, obviously if your patient is not able to break down the drug you can't give them a lot because that will just put more pressure on your liver and then it's paired up with another feed if you also have hepatitis b infection to just also help out with that infection because these are antivirals also and then resistance so it seems that for patients that are on lamivudine there is some sort of mutation that occurs where this mutation causes the viral fitness of the um, HIV virus, it decreases its ability to replicate, and as a result, it's more susceptible to other drugs such as your such as your zidovudine and your stavudine. So this resistance is the only good one because that mutation actually affects the virus in a negative way. <clears throat> then you've got your emtricitabine or FTC, please take note of the full names of these drugs and the abbreviations that they have because mostly in your tests or when you're working in a hospital or a clinic, they'll usually use these abbreviations, so you need to know what they mean. So, emtricitabine is usually in a fixed dose combination of 200 milligrams per hour in one pill and is also used when there's a hepatitis B infection with tenofovir. Then we've got a bag of feed or ABC. This is used in your pediatrics or your children. So it's part of the first line treatment for kids. Um, so they give it 8 milligrams per kilogram. So they would take the child's weight times by 8. That's the dosage that they give. And it's given 12 hourly or by daily. Please note that there's a hypersensitivity reaction that usually occurs after six weeks of treatment. This includes a fever, nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, um, a rash. Some other symptoms include pharyngitis, dyspnea, cough, etc., etc. So please, when you give this medication to kids, please educate your mothers on the things that they need to look out for. Because it, obviously, if they become severe, they need to take them to the nearest hospital as soon as possible possible and it's contraindicated like absolutely contraindicated if you've had a previous hypersensitivity because obviously if they give it to you again there's a high chance that you might actually go into anaphylactic shock and that's very dangerous for kids and then we've got stavudin or d4t i'm not sure why it's called d4t but anyway um the dosage is 30 milligrams for us 12 hour limb if it's used in the long term side effects include which is pretty much an abnormal distribution of fat in your body can also cause lactic acidosis peripheral neuropathy etc etc so please be aware of these side effects another alternative is that they can keep it as a injectable instead of oral and then the last nucleo side um, reverse transcriptase inhibitors or nrti is cytovidin or azt i really don't know why it's called azt like if i had to name it i'll probably give it zdv so that it goes with the letters in the name but anyway so the dosage is 200 to 300 milligrams for all 12 hourly side effects include nausea vomiting uh hematological issues so you need to constantly do hp monitoring if a patient is on site of eating. and as a result it might cause anemia it causes neutropenia which is a decrease in your number of 
neutrophils which are your white blood cells and also leukopenia which is your leukocytes after four to six weeks of treatment so obviously with a patient who's immunocompromised you want to avoid giving them this medication and then also you need to watch out for toxicity and as a result patients that are on hiv medication though constantly have full blood counts just to check for the number of the level of the strike in the body then we've got our non-nucleoside reverse transcriptase inhibitors and it consists of efavirenz, etravirin, nevirapin and rilpivirin. The most important one is efavirenz. So efavirenz is given as a fixed dose, so in the one pill, 600 milligrams per hour at night. Pharmacokinetics is absorption doubles or is goes up by 50% with the high fat meals obviously you want to take it with a really fatty meal but obviously have your good fats instead of your bad fats to avoid obviously obesity and that sort of thing uh, obviously you need to give it at night because it causes vivid dreams dizziness and can also sometimes cause a rash in the first to four six four to six weeks of treatment every several and as a result, I need to give it at night. Wow, English is just failing me today. And it's contraindicated in CNS disorder. So for any people that already have CNS issues, especially like your epileptic patients, you need to avoid giving that medication to them. Then we've got nevipirin or NVP. Uh, it's no longer recommended for newly started patients because it causes a rash and also drug induced hepatitis so obviously you want to avoid that as much as possible and i i really see this medication being given to patients and then and it's also metabolized by your liver so it's got a high drug interaction with your tb medication so all the tb medications that are named that are hepatotoxic Please be aware, especially if your patient has both conditions, TB and HIV, you need to be aware of this combination. So as a result, when patients are being given medications, you need to look at the whole history, what medications are they on and that sort of thing, because the drug interactions can be really dangerous. So you want to avoid them as much as possible and also it causes toxicity and as a result, they will do a... Uh, they will do flu full blood counts and also ALT, it's a liver enzyme that is released, so they also do liver tests. And then we've got your non nucleoside reverse trauma. Okay, I'm not even gonna name that that name is just way too long. The third one is Reuvapirin or RPV. This is a second line gen second line treatment. Um, it's also used as a fixed dose, which is a combination of tenofovir, um, emtricitabine, or lamivudine, and then with ropivirin. And drug interactions with rimfampicin are dangerous, so if the patient is on TB treatment, please do not mix. Or either you choose a different HIV regimen, or you put them on a different TB regimen. Just depends on the patient's condition. And if the patient has a viral load of more than 100,000 copies, please do not use it. Okay, and then we've got our integrase inhibitors. This consists of retrogravir, dolutagravir, or cobicistat. The most important one that you need to know is dolutagravir <coughs> or DTG. It's a first-line regimen or alternate first-line regimen in a fixed dose combination. So it would be dolut I mean, tenofovir, emtricitabine, or lamivudine and dolutography but i'll speak about this later on and the dosage is 50 milligrams once daily it's superior to effervirant because it's got a better, better tolerability so patients are able to tolerate it much better and it's got a higher barrier to resistance so it's less likely to have a resistance to it and as a result it's mostly used for most patients. Side effects include mild or self-limiting insomnia. And as a result, they'll suggest that you take it in the morning so that obviously you experience your insomnia during the day. And then at night, you're fine. It can cause some headaches, some CNS issues, such as dizziness and that sort of thing. It can cause some 
gastro issues such as nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, etc., and then also causes weight gain. So if you've got an obese patient, you'd rather put them on nifavirenz than dolutegravir because of the weight gain that it causes. And then please note that it causes neural tube defects. So if a patient is pregnant, you need to avoid giving them this regimen during the first trimester. So most people suggest rather avoid it during your whole pregnancy, but mostly in your first trimester. And then you've got your fusion inhibitors and your chemonokine receptor antagonists. These are not used in the government. They're used in the private sector, so you don't even need to know about them. But examples include infuviratide and maraviroc. <clears throat> so drug interactions that you need to know. So remfampicin decreases dolutogravir. As a result, the dolutogravir dosage will have to be doubled to 50 milligrams. 12 hourly or 100 milligrams once daily and then you've got your polyvalent cations which are found in your antacids in the multivitamins in your nutritional supplements and that sort of thing so they decrease dolutogravir as a result you need to take these supplements two hours after dolutogravir or six hours before dolutogravir and you need to take them with your food so that they interact as little as possible with dolutogravir and then if you're on any anticonvulsants and also decrease dolutogravir, therefore rather use another form of anticonvulsants such as your valproate, lamotrigine, etc., etc. And then metformin, um, its interaction with your HIV medication, especially dolutogravir, is it increases metformin and as a result, it can cause hypoglycemia in patients. And as a result, the maximum dosage that you can give patients of metformin is 500 milligrams 12 hourly if they're on dolutogravir. So as you can see, it's very, very important to be aware of what type of medications that your patients are on. Even if your multivitamins might sound insignificant, you need to ask those questions so that you know what what medications they can get. And also as a nurse, you need to be able to educate your patients about these issues. And then we've got what is known as your boosted protease inhibitors or your protease inhibitors. So these are not used on their own because they've got a lot of side effects and drug interactions. Therefore, it's used in combination with other things. Examples of protease inhibitors is atazanafir, darunavir, lopinavir, and ritonavir. The last two are the most important ones that you need to know. So ritonavir, therapeutic doses... Um, are poorly tolerated because they cause GIT intolerance and their drug interactions are major like it causes hypercholesteremia. so obviously for obese patients it's very dangerous but for most patients it is dangerous because it can cause heart issues and that sort of thing but is it is a pharmacokinetic enhancer so as a result it enhances or increases the a dosage of other drugs and as a result it must be used as a at sub therapeutic levels and as a result it will have less side effects so these sub therapeutic levels is either 150 or 25 milligrams once daily and obviously it decreases the metabolism of other of other protease inhibitors so obviously if there's less or a decreased metabolism of the other drugs that means there'll be a increased drug level in the blood at a lower dosage and as a result it will have less side effects so for example if you are being given right to never fear at subpar levels and then you're being given another medication such as lopinavir at normal therapeutic levels you don't have to increase the lopinavir levels to be effective you can just give it with a little bit of right to never fear because because it decreases the metabolism of lopinavir and as a result you can use less of it while also using a lower dosage and as a result we have less side effects i hope you guys understood what i'm trying to say there well so lopinavir this is given at 400 or 100 milligrams 12 hourly per hour and it's also known as alluvium side effects includes dizziness i mean diarrhea 
and long-term effects can cause lipid dystrophy or metabolic disorders and as a result it causes toxicity therefore you need to do your agts every six months and annually and then we've got a thousand of fear um it's given 300 milligrams in addition to right to never feed 100 milligrams daily so this one would cause a decreased metabolism of this as a result you can give this at lower level but there'll be more in the blood so there'll be more atv in the blood if you add it in addition to right to never feed because it decreases metabolism of atv it also decreases the potential of dyslipidemia and GIT issues, but it does cause hyperbilirubinemia. So it's more of a cosmetic problem because it causes an orange tinge to you, but it's got the least amount of side effects. Okay, so your ARV regimens. So these are the fixed dose combination tablets I was referring to, and this is your first line treatment. So it can either be a combination of tenofovir um, being or lamivudine with efavirenz or they can pair it up with dolutegravir depending on the patient's condition and that sort of thing. So when it comes to HIV testing, how it usually works is you have the first test. If it's possible, if it's positive, they'll want to start you on HIV medication as soon as possible. But if it's negative, they call it a window period where you have to test again after 12 weeks. Because you can ha you can be negative, Nim, but you might still have the virus in you, but it hasn't, the test is not as sensitive to it because you do not have that many viral copies in your body. And as a result, if it's negative, they'll wait for 12 weeks and then check again just to confirm the first test and then when it comes to infants they will do what is known as a pcr so obviously like i mentioned if someone who is hiv positive gives birth to a child obviously the mother already be on treatment and that sort of thing to prevent transmitting while they're pregnant and then after the baby is born they will be tested, which is what is known as a PCR. They will also be tested at 6 weeks, 10 weeks, sometimes 14 weeks, and then at 6 months. At 6 months, most babies, they are start being breastfed during that point. And as a result, they have to take the PCR or the HIV test again uh, 6 weeks after they have been breastfed. And then they will check it again at 9 months, 12 months. And then at 18 months, the child can have a rapid HIV test that normal adults have. <clears throat> so once you've been tested for HIV, they will do what is known as the test and treat approach. So if you're tested positive, they'll want to start ARVs on the same day, especially with pregnant women, to avoid transmitting to the child. And then obviously there's a few exceptions to the rule. So if you're on TB treatment, they want to wait until two weeks up uh, till you are stable on tb treatment so if you've already been on tb treatment for a few months then they can start it and then if you've got signs and symptoms of cryptococcal meningitis they obviously want to wait six to eight weeks and then you've got if you've got tb meningitis they want to wait four to eight weeks so that you get your treatment for that and that sort of thing then start your hiv medication and then if you've got cryptococcal antigen positive so you don't have the symptoms yes but you've got the antigen in your body then they wait two weeks while you're on fluconazole treatment and then start your HIV medication and then if you've got an acute illness like bacterial pneumonia they'll wait for one to two weeks before they can start your treatment and if you've got signs and symptoms of liver disease then they'll want to manage the cause of that first before they start you on any treatment because remember most HIV medication they're hepatotoxic or they'll cause some liver issues or they are um, metabolized by your liver so obviously they'll have dry interactions with that and that sort of thing so you don't want to give a patient who's already got a liver issue medication that's going to affect them then we've got what is known as HIV monitoring it consists of three stages you've got clinical staging immunological monitoring and viral load so clinical staging according to the World Health Organization it is the indication of the degree of immune suppression and obviously if you're at stage four you've got 
little to no immune suppression obviously if you had stage one you've got a high immune suppression so please just read up on the different four stages when it comes to that you need to know which organ or which body part is being affected at each stage because there's certain things that are being affected at each stage so when it comes to your hiv infection you've got what is known as your acute retroviral syndrome which is pretty much the symptoms that you have so you have flu-like symptoms and at that point your hiv is spreading throughout the body so clinically you have fever night sweats headaches pharyngitis a rash nausea diarrhea and that sort of thing now when it comes to immunological monitoring it's pretty much just checking your blood counts so how many cd4 cells do you have so your normal levels is 600 to 1000 um, cells per centimeter but obviously it can range um, depending on <clears throat> infections nutrition tests variability physiology and that sort of thing so obviously the smaller the number the more immunosuppressed you are and there's a higher chance of being infected by the illness so obviously you wanted to have a high cd4 count and a low viral load so this can be used to monitor the response to treatment so if you've been started on treatment and then at six months they take your blood and they check that you've what's your cd4 count and if your cd4 count is still low that means your hiv medication is not working as well because your cd4 cells should have been you know becoming more because the viral load is being decreased by your medication so obviously if your cd4 count is not increasing that means you're not responding well to treatment and they might have to change treatment and then other things that fall under immunological treatment monitoring would be doing PEP. So after you've had sex with someone who has was HIV positive, you need to take it within 72 hours for 28 days. Then you also have known one is known as PrEP, which is pre-exposure prophylaxis, which is usually taken by discounted couples. So a uh, discounted couple is a couple where one is HIV positive and the other is negative, and this is just to protect the one who is HIV negative, and then PMTCT. Then we've got viral load, which correlates with infectiousness. So the higher viral load, the higher chance of transmission. So less than 50 copies per milliliter means you've got an undetectable viral load, which is what most people aim for. And that means you have got a smaller chance of infecting. And then if you've got more than a thousand copies per milliliter, that means there is viral failure. And as a result, they have to put you on second regimen treatment as soon as possible. And then monitoring of your ARVs. So at every single visit that you come for a medication, they need to screen for TB symptoms and to check what viral, I mean, what HIV staging you are at. Are you at WHO stage one, two, three, or four? And that will just check what your immunosuppression is and to see how well you are reacting to the medication. Then they'll do a CD4 count every 12 months, a viral load every six and 12th month. And then they were doing ALT. ALT is just um, an enzyme that is released by your enzyme uh, if it's being damaged and that sort of thing. So they'll check this one if you are neveropin and if you develop any rash or symptoms of hepatitis. This is just a symptom of hepatic damage. And then a full blood count is done at every third, sixth, and twelfth month of every year. If you want to never fear to just check toxicity levels. And then they'll check fasting, cholesterol, and triglycerides on month three if you're on lopinavir or adenovir because obviously it causes hypercholesteremia. So you want to be checking for all those things. So I know this is a mouthful, but the biggest advice I can give you is to make cue cards. Where because especially with your HIV medication, you've got different classes and certain medications fall under different classes. So you can have different colored cue cards that will say this is this class so example if you've got your nucleoside your nrti's you can have them in red and then you have a list of them what the medication is the abbreviation it's very important the side effects drug interactions and any other important things cue cards will be the easiest ones for you to know and all other stuff is just general stuff that you need to know but hopefully this helps 
I know it's a mouthful and it's a lot, but yeah, that's pretty much TB, HIV, and antivirals.